Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I don't like it when we have to send out a text to people to say this is what the subject matter will be. Because you can come up with a great idea, but then as you start to study, you think, is that what I said I was going to talk about? And you're thinking, heck, is that really what I'm talking about? So I hope it fits in with what uh, was text today, a little bit. Um, I just know that it's been on my heart for a, uh, a couple of weeks, and um, I'm just going to try and bring it. Uh, I'll try and be short, as I can be. Um, but on the text, it said that uh, I was going to talk about everybody's looking for a convincing story that gives them a sense of purpose and also about the revolutionary lifestyle that Jesus has invited us to live. Now, if you're thinking, where's that come from? If you've not been awake, so wake up because that is going on every single Saturday night and we don't make any apologies for showing it every week because we know psychology that it takes forever for some of those things to actually the penny to drop seriously so we if you're getting bored i don't care we are going to keep banging that drum <clears throat> seriously because these are things that we decided we are absolutely convinced about these things there's a lot of things we're not convinced about absolutely convinced about them but then what we wanted to try and do was talk about it a little bit so that we clarify what we mean is that okay so Who's made a New Year's resolution? Right? One, two, couple? We're not into them, a few? Why do we make New Year's resolutions? It's because at the end of the day, we have this idea that there are things that we need, that if we changed our lifestyle or whatever, things could be better. Yeah? Isn't that right? Thank you. Um, we have a thirst for something. I'm going to be talking about thirst a little bit later on, but I want to sort of spring off from the fact that we all think, okay, if I had more of this, then I'd be happier. Life would be better if I had this, that, and the other. And where I want to start is in this uh, particular thing about everybody looking for a convincing story that gives them a sense of purpose is, where do you think religions are birthed from? It's from a desire or a thirst to understand stuff. So, for instance, we create religions of all sorts of things, and Christianity is no different, so don't get the idea that I'm saying we are right and everybody else is <coughs> wrong. But basically, we have needs, and we have things that we want explaining or, or making sense of. So we look for a convincing story that gives us a sense of purpose. Um, Excuse me. Now, some people don't find it in religion per se, but whatever they find that sense of purpose in becomes a religion to them. So if you find your sense of purpose in playing football every week, it will become your religion because your whole heart and soul will be in that and that's what gives you a reason for living. So don't get the idea that we're just talking about religious stuff. It, it might be things we do religiously. Do, do you get it? But there are many questions that we have. We want relief from suffering. We want solution to the questions that we've got about why we're here, how the world was made, what's it all about, Alfie, you know. Um, we have craving for meaning. And some of us have a, 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 an inbuilt sense of unworthiness and even a fear of death. And we're saying, what's this about? How can I find an answer to these questions? It, does that cover it, really? So, how do you think religions are created? Because somebody stands up, a bit like on the film The Life of Brian, and starts spouting out a whole bunch of stuff, and they all follow Brian. Because he's saying some good stuff. Yeah? Do you get it? And that has happened down the centuries, because we're all looking for a sense of purpose. And 
God's always come into it because we always believe that there's something out there that's bigger and greater than we are, that if we can only tap into that, everything will be all right. Is that simple enough? So you know now where religions come from. Oh, sorry, I'm really thirsty again. So we think that if we get these answers, so everyone's looking for a convincing story. We say we have one, right? But what I want to ask is what is the story? Not that we, that ours is a convincing story. Now I know I'm playing with words a little bit because <clears throat> we're all convinced by different things. Think about it. How is our story convincing? And I want to tell you in one sense that it's not because it's actually counter to what most religions are offering. See, most religions are offering something that appeases something out there beyond us in order that we're okay, whereas actually our story that we hope to convince you about is that it's actually not like that at all, that Jesus came not in order to appease God's anger, but he gave his life to put an end to our ridiculous, made-up ideas of what we have to do to find meaning in life. That's why he came. Now, can you see why the story is now turned on its head? Because religions say there has to be something you do to attain, whereas actually Jesus came to say, actually, I'll turn all this on its head. Yet what happened? We created just another religion, and Christianity more or less became the same as every other. Now, some of you don't like us to talk like that, but it did and you only have to watch a program on Rome or Constantine or whatever to find out what I'm telling you is historic, not, not just our, you know, our idea. So our message, in all honesty here at The Rock, I'd like it to be more convincing, but it actually isn't as convincing as I'd like it to be. And let me tell you why. Because human beings don't like anything that is given to a person, they only like something that they have to become themselves. Aren't we nuts? It doesn't gravitate, human nature, to a message that tells us that we're okay, just as we are. Think about it. We always want to attain to something else, and that's why you get all these problems. Oh, if you do this, you'll be better. Why is it that we won't accept that the message, which is so incredible that Jesus came to give us, was that he's actually saying, all your ideas of how to fix things is ridiculous because you're trying to fix the problem that doesn't even exist. Whoa, get your head around that one. See, all our lives we've been told that the cross is a bridge between sinful humanity and a holy God, haven't we? That's the story that's been told. But if you think about it, if, if the cross is only a bridge, what happens when something undermines that bridge? I love the... Uh, thing where the Tac Tacoma Bridge, if you go online, you'll see it. Suddenly there's a big gust of wind and this great big suspension bridge starts buckling. And it, it was made to stand, it was, but something, and it started to wobble and it all came crashing down. You see, if it's a bridge, the cross and Jesus, what he did was a bridge, then we must get things right, we must be right, we must worship right in order to keep the bridge in Tact. Oh, that gets complicated, doesn't it? Wouldn't you agree? Rather than if Jesus came to make sure we understood that there was no gap, that means that nothing. Now, you could say, oh, yes, you could get a sinkhole. I was watching a program about sinkholes. That was really interesting. Well, you could get a sinkhole. Yeah, but you get my point. If there is nothing that's like fragile over this great chasm, 
There's nothing that can make it fall. You're actually standing on solid ground. So Jesus didn't come to bridge a gap, which at any moment could, with a gust of wind or a lack of faith or a, a, a situation in our lives that becomes, you know, you, 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 you face things that, that challenge your faith. No. He says, what I'm going to make sure you know is that there was never a, a problem in the first place. Now, some of you will struggle to get your head around that. But that's our story, and we want you to be convinced by it. Because if you're convinced by that, I know it's going to do you a, a lot of good. So, it means that if I understand this, I learn the difference between being saved and being righteous. See, if I'm saved, there is something that... Sorry? Yeah, please, no, hell. Yeah, that you're being saved from. Whereas if you're made righteous, you're basically being brought to a place of understanding that rests in just an understanding that actually never, ever can be taken away. Other than, I suppose, if we want to get down to it, you just deciding, I don't want it, I don't want anything to do with it, and I think you'd be daft to do that. But what I'm trying to say is it's something that's a gift. And if it's a gift, nothing you can do can, for that gift to be taken away. Now, that's good news. Yeah, how lovely. Anyway, the Bible says that we hunger, and if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we will be filled. Now, isn't it interesting? We started talking about thirst at the, at the beginning and what we thirst after because we feel will make us feel better or will attain more. What this scripture is basically saying, and remember the word filled is a, is a continual something tense. Come on, Jenny, help me. Filled, present continual tense. That's what I was looking for. It's not that you're filled and then you get empty and then you have to fill up again. He says, you seek after righteousness and you will be filled, period. Now, some people don't like that. They say, oh, no, we've got to keep coming back, keep coming back for a drink. And I'm going to show you in a minute that that's just not true. Oh, and I get excited. <laughs> okay, so are we okay with the fact that there was never a gap cross was never a bridge, but the, the story that we are trying to get over and we want you to be convinced by is the fact that the righteousness that you have been given, that you have been told you have, is everlasting, it's not going anywhere, and we want you to be convinced with that. Does that, is that helpful? Oh, lovely, because you see, if you get that, if the penny will drop, then you will know how to live out there in the world. Because we're going to get, in a minute, we're going to get to this revolutionary lifestyle. Wait, shut up, Chris. We'll get there in a minute. Okay. So we are, are we okay with this? Um, because there's something about us, and I've already said this, that prefers to become something by ourselves than it is to be bestowed upon. And that's really the good news, that we are bestowed upon and we don't have to become anything. So, that's why we use the term in this church, the ungodlike God, because we can point you to many, many religions where there are similarities that says, God needs to be appeased, you're not good enough, and unless you attain it, you're not, you know, you're not in, whereas this ungodlike God is saying, actually, I'm, I'm here to show you that they were all your harebrained ideas, which you didn't need to you need, didn't need to do, didn't need to get involved in. Does that make sense? All right. So let me move on. So, um, okay. Why are we thirsty then? Well, I could say it's because I'm dehydrated and because I'm nervous and etc. If we're talking about it in the context of as human beings, we have a thirst for stuff. And we do. We have a thirst, don't we? Think about you just your last week. What have you thirsted over? We thirst over relationships. We thirst over uh, better jobs. We thirst over re having more respect. We thirst over being 
uh, having more recognition or more affirmation or more understanding from our husbands or better sleep from our children or a better, you know, come on, put, put it there. I'm not stupid. You, you look at me as though butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, but you know what I'm talking about. You do. But you see, dip first. Which, comes, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I love this. Something for the lab, isn't it? What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Are we thirsty for those things because we were told we needed those things? Or do we really need those things and that's why we're thirsty? Ooh, I like questions like that. We'll have to tackle it, won't we, on a Wednesday night? See, which comes first? See, I could say, if we take the Bible, and I know we've talked about not everything is to be taken literal, but we get great meaning from the Bible. Whether things happened like they said it did or not, it doesn't really matter, because what you get is meaning, right? And if you go back to Genesis, it talks about uh, when Adam had basically, you know, the story about original sin, you've got the question that comes from God to Adam, who told you you were naked? Who told them? I love that because God's basically saying, I never said a word. I never mentioned nakedness. Where did you get that idea from? Somebody told them, right? We're not going to follow that anymore, but we are going to pick up at the bit where I'm asking you, who's told you you're thirsty? Oh, but I am. And I, listen, New Year, what do we all do? We all come out of the woodwork ready for a new year. I don't know why. What, what gets into us? Oh, new year, let's get cracking. It's no different from the last week of December, for crying out loud. But something gets in us. It's almost like a bug. Well, it is, isn't it? And we change and we become all, oh, set goals. Let's do this. Let's do it. Why? You weren't setting goals the last week of December. <laughs> Were you? Come on, be honest. It's almost as we wind the year down, we get through Christmas, and then, oh, it's a new year. Let's do something different. What's wrong with us? Who told you you were thirsty? There is a discontentment that's within us that is either there, and like I say, this is to talk about on a Wednesday night, but it's either there because it's real, or it's not real, but somebody's told us we're thirsty, and then we go about all these incredible ways of, of quenching that thirst. Do you agree? So, let's move on a little bit. We've been told, in society at large, in the context of religions, that we are sinful flesh. We've been told that we, if we go by what's called Calvinism, which was a sort of a doctrine that originated 1511 ish. Um, we were told that we were totally depraved. That's nice, isn't it? Isn't that great? Do you like the idea of being told that? I don't. So if you've been told you're thirsty in big capital letters, do you might think you might think you are? Oh, I'm thirsty. I don't, I don't know if I'm making sense here, but I think the penny might drop later. So, if we have been told all our lives by religions that we're down here, God is up there, we've got to bridge this gap, so we thirst after stuff that's going to fill that gap. Now, some of you, like I say, it's not about spiritual stuff, it's not about religious stuff, but it's about relationships, it's about it's about uh, peer pressure. It's about getting what you need from your friends at school. It's about if I take these drugs, everybody's going to accept me and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's not just about religion, but religion is, is, is one that we all fall into. And that's where I want to bring you to the story of the woman at the well. Because this just blew me away this week. And hopefully I can uh, find it on here. Um, I don't want to really read it because I find that just dull. Um, 
No, maybe that was naughty. I, I prefer to tell a story than to read it, but on the other hand, I might miss, miss bits out, but basically, you can go and read it for yourself, because I don't want to run out of time, and I want there to be an opportunity at the end for you to sort of connect with this. But in uh, John chapter 4, there is the story of Jesus, basically. He goes to sit at a well. Now, you've got to look at it in the cultural terms. In this day and age, it might be he might have been sat at a bar, you know, and somebody came in off the street and wanted a drink, wanted a pint. So don't get all stupid. It was just a cultural situation. If you, if you needed water, you went to a well. You had a, 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 a bucket or a vase with you, and you put it down, you picked up your water, and you went on your way. And this story is about this woman who went to the well and Jesus was there and they entered into a, a wonderful conversation. And uh, what it shows me is just really this convincing, well, this, no, sorry, this story that I want you to be convinced about. That's a better way of putting it, isn't it? So in John 4, now we have this encounter and uh, maybe I should just read it, it might just be better for me. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, right, so he sat at the well. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy some food. So he's just sat there having uh, five minutes. So the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Again, see if I read it, I'll want to pick up on all these bits. The truth is, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. So it's not a good start, is it? Right? We all think when we get with Jesus, oh, it's going to be lovely this and the other. She's already feeling bad because he's a Jew. She's a Samaritan. And Samaritans and Jews just do not get along. All right? Bad start. But anyway, um, Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift. Ooh, we've talked about a gift. What was the gift? righteousness, if you knew the gift of God, and knew it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water, it all, so, sounds all very poetic, this, doesn't it, just give us a drink, you know, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, where can you, where can you get this living water, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, and did also the sons and his sons. Really, she's getting a bit religious here. Because it's, 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 she's starting to open up the war between the Jews and the Samaritans, you see. Can you see what she's doing? But clearly she had a thirst, didn't she? Isn't she showing a thirst? Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water, meaning the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty. These are great words, you know. So that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she'd, can you see how she'd move from physical to something far deeper? She forgot about, well, I'm still going to have to have water, water. But I'm thinking to myself, if I can get this water, something's going to change in me to stop me constantly seeking for the things that I feel will make my life better. Yes? So move on. We get into a, a bit of a, a dialogue here. He told her, go call your husband. Do you not think he would have just said, let's have your, let's have your bars then, you know, here you go. No, he takes her down a, another little alley. Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Now, people get hung up on that, that Jesus is somehow declaring what a wicked woman she was. No. No. Come on. No way. They're absolutely right there. He says, yeah, you've told me right. That's, that's your story. That's your story. Isn't that lovely? What you've said is quite right. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. And then we get into a religious thing. Our fathers worshipped at this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Oh, heck, 
Your religion, my religion. Have you got it? Whoa, come on, let's sort this. Who's right? Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming. And then he, I'll, I'll keep reading, sorry. When you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. And I didn't really want to read that because I don't want to get you down a, a rabbit hole. But yet time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus then said, I who speak to you am he. Right, that's gorgeous. But the next bit is even better. Listen to this. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. Yeah, come on, get that. They're already judging. They're already saying, what are you doing talking to that woman? Heck, disciples, take a slap in if that's how you operate. Yes? But look at this. But no one asked. This is the disciples. Nobody asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? See, they weren't really interested in the nitty gritty of her thirsty, thirsty soul. But look at this. Are you ready? If you're not thrilled with this, I'm just, I'm going to scream, yeah. <laughs> then, then... Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. Towards him. Now, we're not going any further. But listen, she left her jar by the well, didn't fill it up and take the water with her. She left it. Why? Because suddenly, she was... But what had happened? It says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Sorry, nose white. Did he? No. He didn't. But he did something brilliant. Now... Give me just a couple of minutes to go through some of these things. That woman was by her culture, her country, what had been impressed on her in the eyes of her peers. She was inferior. She was untouchable. She was a harlot, possibly. Five husbands, all this, that, and the other. And basically, she spent her life well-hopping like that hopping wells for a drink of something that would satisfy her soul yeah what was the deep void it tells us in the story there was two voids one she was messed up mentally probably you would be if you'd had five husbands and potentially all died or all left you or whatever come on let's be kind here she was messed up psychologically her relationships weren't working for her. She was thirsty. Remember in those days, if you didn't have somebody to help you, there was no social security. You needed a guy to, to put food on your table. Bless her little cotton socks. She was also in a mess spiritually. Why? Well, they say we're supposed to worship on this mountain. They say we're supposed to worship on this mountain. But we know that when this guy turns up called the Messiah, Oh, he'll sort everything out and make it all worthwhile. But she was spiritually confused. Now, I'm going to ask a question. Put your hand up if you are spiritually confused. Up oh, right now. Way! And be proud. Seriously, I am not taking the mick here. Because there's too many people who are so convinced that what they've understood about the rights and wrongs of doctrine, etc., somehow puts them in a good place. But what really was going on here, she's saying, I haven't a clue right across the board and one terrible mess. 
if I find God or if I find a new husband or I find this, then I'll be all right. So let me ask a question. This Messiah, when he then turns around and says, I am he, who then said, when she had said, when he turns up, everything will be all right. All of a sudden, everything comes together because he hadn't told her anything about herself other than, I am he, you are you, just as you are, I approve of you. And on that basis, everything is fine. I think that's awesome. He didn't answer her questions. He didn't tell her which mountain that she should worship on. Yet he assures her that he is the answer that she was seeking. Give me this water. So what had he addressed? He addressed the fact that he knew her, that she didn't need approval of anybody else, or perfect relationships, or squeaky clean set of doctrines. What he knew about her in that moment, he loved and he accepted and he approved of. There was nothing more she needed to do. Do you understand now why she left the water jar? <laughs> I've written down something I want to just move on to. The lifestyle that we have called, been called to live is not a set of rules. I could have stood up here tonight and given you a wonderful exposition on uh, the passage in Matthew that says, uh, uh, turn the other cheek. Oh, this is a lifestyle thing to do. Uh, go the second mile. And if somebody wants your, your jacket, uh, your shirt, give them your jacket as well. We could have said, yeah, they're incredible lifestyle, revolutionary ways of living. But you know what? What Jesus was saying is that the revolutionary lifestyle that I want you to live is not a set of doctrinal rules, but an understanding of what Jesus came to do. It was to see you, to know you, to know your story and go, I think that's just blooming awesome. It's an understanding. And when we get that understanding, there is an opportunity for us to do the other things, like turn the other cheek and go the second mile. But I'll tell you what, if you don't get the understanding first, you'll never be able to do any of those things. Understanding. understanding. So listen to this. When the life of which we are ashamed, please just listen to this, with which we are discontented, or even just terrified to live, is something that God says needs no escaping. He knows it, approves of it, and is fully intent of living it with us. That's salvation. That's righteousness. That's the revolutionary lifestyle that you've been called to live. Do you understand this? <laughs> Can you see why Jesus asked that question a lot? Do you understand? Because it was about understanding, not stuff that you did. The stuff that you do comes with the understanding. But I'm looking at you now. Lots of you are thirsty. Why? Because you think that if I only could have, I'd be all right. When actually, I'm going to read it again. When the life of which we are ashamed, with which we are discontented, or even just terrified to live, is something that we understand God says needs no escaping. That's when we know that he knows us and we have been seen by him. And then we'll be able to go and tell everybody, Come and see a man who told me. Told me what? Told me that I was all right. Any of this making sense? 
Our thirsts are a daft attempt at solving a problem that doesn't need solving. Now you're going to say, well, if that's the case, what are we doing in a church? Because I will probably have to tell you this a million times and you will still not remember. Because human nature wants to gravitate back, even, and some of you aren't going to like this, even believing that if you come to church, you'll make everything all right. God will bless you on oh, the sky's the limit. Sorry, that's not how it works. Your life does not need escaping. Oh, and some of you are saying, oh, yes, it does. I'll tell you what, the moment you stop trying to escape it, everything will change. I know it will. Because it says we try to escape, we get stuck into our discontentments and our upsets and all this, that and the other. Now, I know we've got to finish, but let me just uh, look at this. Where do most of our upsets come from? Uh, sorry, our thirst comes from. It's our upsets, isn't it? And I've mentioned it already, but I'm going to mention it again. For recognition, for affirmation, for love, for belonging, for position, to be right. For money, a better life, better relationships, more respect, more understanding. They're the things that we constantly have our cup and we come into a well hoping that if I dig it down and have a drink, all that will be sorted. But what Jesus is saying, come and have a drink of me, realize that everything's okay, leave your water pot and go. Anybody up for that? As a New Year's resolutions that we don't really believe in, but you know what I'm saying. Who would like to actually say, if, if there's one res resolution that I will try to make, is I will believe that God is living my life with me, and he approves of me. I don't need anybody else's approval, and I'm going to let him wa walk out my life with me, believing that I've been given his righteousness, and that's enough. When you think about the garden, just think about it. When, when, he's, when uh, Adam's... Uh, uh, um, when God said to Adam, who told you you were naked? Think about what happens next. The story goes on to say that God even made them clothes to put on them. And I just got to thinking, yeah. So he quenched their thirst. They're not naked anymore. Then what? There's still not enough. Oh, yeah, but what? Do you know, you can hear it, can't you? Okay, well, we're covered up now, but oh, hey, is he still all right? Is he all right with us? I mean, heck, we did what we did. You know, are you with me? Because we'll always be thirsty unless we realize there wasn't a problem with God in the first place. So who's gonna, and I want some signs. I want, we're gonna sing a song. We're gonna sing that wonderful uh, song, Then I Shall Live as One Who's Been Forgiven. I mean, it's a beautiful song. Words are great. Words of absolute commitment to a lifestyle Remember that lifestyle isn't doing stuff. It's the understanding that he knows you, he knows your story, and it's fine. Do you get me? And while we're doing that, I want an opportunity if anybody wants to come and stand around the front as a symbol, and it is only a symbol, that basically you're leaving your jar, you're going to leave it at the front, and you're going to say, I'm not picking that up anymore. We've got one coming already, have we? Bless him. So, can we get somebody for the, the music and then we'll... No, just stay down there, sweetheart. I don't want you falling. Just stay down there. Thank you. Stay there. That's lovely. I hope the pennies dropped about the fact that... that the story we want you to be convinced about is one of Jesus telling us that our, all our attempts to quench our thirst are just pointless. And let him be the one who sees us, accepts us, and quenches that thirst. Oh, I just loved it. I loved it when I read, and she left. She left it. Whoa! She left it! Let's leave it. No more thirsting, right? No more thirsting. Come on, let's sing. And uh, like I say, this is an opportunity. It's not for my sake, it's for yours. Because often we need to do something.
to say, yeah, I get that. If the penny's dropped, I'm going to do that. No more thirsting.
All right, just before we go, let's just pray for everybody who made some connection with that. Okay, Father, thank you for this amazing story that was shared tonight. And uh, that down water pot is such a burden. Coming with the empty and then trying to struggle with something we're supposed to do when it's filled just heavy and weighty and burdensome. But you came to lift that burden. You said, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. And if that's because our thirst is quenched in you and we no longer have to be dragging around these self-filled pots, then we understand. So Father, I just pray for everybody tonight whose heart has reached out for this truth that first of all, they will understand the righteousness that is theirs because of you, that we do not have to strive to get or strive to keep because you have given it to us. And also that our hearts will be freed from fear and anxiety and the distress that comes from always having to try and achieve what it is that we think we need for the thirst that we think we have. That you've given us a revelation and understanding tonight. We can leave our water pot at the well and we can go filled and satisfied, learning to live that radical life, to love and to care and to share because of what you've done for us. So we thank you. We receive it. I release it tonight. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. And uh, bless you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.